So what is the topic today? The critical documents that everyone over the age of 18 needs and why they're so critical. And I think this is especially poignant. If you have adult children, maybe they are about to turn 18, maybe they already turned 18. You might not be aware of what this means from a legal perspective. Or if you yourself are a young adult uh, around 18 years old or just over that early 20s, maybe you don't know about these critical tools that you need to have in place. This is a really important talk. You're not aware of these issues. And the fact is, everyone over the age of 18 needs these legal documents in place. We're going to tell you what these legal documents are in just a second and why they're so important. And without these documents, you can be exposed to tens of thousands in court costs, the loss of control, or worse. There are many situations where a lack of these documents can cause major, major issues, resulting in a child or adult child's life taking a turn for the worse, where parents can't even help when they want to. So what are we going to cover here today? The key topics what happens when my child turns 18. What changes? Why are all of a sudden these documents so important? What are these critical documents? What do we need and why? So how can I as a parent or loved one help with financial or business of life issues? How can I stay involved in medical issues and talk to doctors? How can I look at my children's educational records once they're 18? If you have a child with a disability, this is also crucial. Many people think that when their child turns 18, if they have a disability, they have to go to court and get a conservatorship to take over decision-making. That may not be the case. We can often avoid that and keep things in the family and out of the public court system. And summing this all up, how do we put this all into place? How can we be sure this is done the right way? All the documents are there to make sure you and your family are covered. And you don't need to take our word for what we're about to talk about. There are plenty of articles in the media, the Wall Street Journal's written every two or three years, they publish a new article about this. There are documents that you need to create when your child turns 18. For those of you who don't know us, um, and many of you do, so welcome. Just wanna tell a little bit about us. We're, I'm, I'm, a, I'm Mark Gilfix, I'm a partner at Gilfix and the Poll Associates. I'm here with Renee Conrad. She's an amazing attorney who's worked with hundreds of our client families. She's been with her firm for many years. So Renee, please say hello. Hello. <laughs> and Renee is gonna be sharing more of her perspective in just a, in a moment. And for those of you who don't know our firm, we've been in California for over 40 years now, which is crazy. Um, Starting in the early 80s, we've served thousands of families throughout the Bay Area and really throughout the state of California, from San Diego all the way up to the Oregon border. If you're in California, we can help you. And Zoom has made that easier than ever for people who aren't even right around the Palo Alto office where we're located. Um, but we've helped so many thousands of families to save hundreds of millions of dollars, whether you're high net worth or not, there's so much value we can add when it comes to estate planning and integrated uh, legal and financial planning and thinking about these issues. Um, and our goal is to provide extraordinary value and peace of mind to our clients. We think about estate planning and elder law um, and quality of life issues for our families. We want to be thought partners to them. Um, and so that's what this is about, spreading the word, educating and empowering you so you know the issues that your family has to deal with. And we can help you with all these issues. So let's jump back in. What happens when my child turns 18? So Renee, you have adult adult children, quote unquote, why don't you talk to us about what happens from a legal standpoint when a child turns 18? Sure. Yeah. I did want to just kind of join and, and weigh in because this is a subject that's, that's close to my heart. Um, I do have a daughter who's in college and my son is a senior in high school. So going through that, you know, transition right now about to go away to college and it is, you know, such a busy, such a busy time for all of us. And I want to say these are very important documents. Um, so yeah, at 18, your child is legally an adult and it's a, an important milestone. Um, even knowing this, um, when my son turned 18 recently, um, I tried to schedule a doctor's appointment for him and my access had been revoked. So, I mean, it's night and day the moment you turn 18. Um, and you do lose access to educational, financial, medical records. Um, and those relationships that you had before, you know, they're concerned about their liability, their exposure, and all the privacy rights, which of course we do support privacy rights. But as parents, we're so used to helping our children and being there for them. Um, 
Yeah. And then when your child does turn um, 18, um, you know, it's up to them whether they want to give you permission to help them or not. And not all children want their parents involved. Um, and when you have that relationship, you want to make sure that it's clearly documented so that you can help if they have an issue or if they lose capacity. Um, and if even if you have a child who doesn't want to name you, um, they should be naming someone who's a trusted backup so that they will have someone in place. Um, so this is, these are very critical documents and can make just your life and your child's life a lot easier. Yeah. And I think a lot of people think, well, my kids are 18. Like what? They're not going to have health issues. They're not going to, when am I going to need this? But the reality is stuff happens. You know, we have many clients who called us even in the last few months where a young, relatively young adult child recently had a stroke um, and has been in the hospital for weeks. I'm helping a client right now dealing with some of those issues. Um, studying abroad, you know, you're pretty hard to sign documents if you're hiking the trails of Cambodia and a key student aid package <laughs> comes in, who's gonna sign there? Um, so it's not just disasters, but there's many other situations where this can come up. So as, as Renee just said, it's crucial to empower trusted backups. And that's what this is all about, by the way. It's about empowering the right people, ideally parents, if there's a good relationship. It doesn't have to be parents. Um, but how can a child do this once they are 18? Again, the term child is relative. Well, financial issues, the key document is a durable power of attorney. And I always think that's such a funny term, like a power of attorney. Uh, so let's say you've helped your daughter um, or your son with financial issues your whole life. You've paid their bills. You've helped them make sure that their uh, expenses are covered, that all any legal forms are filled out, any student applications are done. You've helped them. But once they turn 18, no matter how much you've helped them, no matter how many bills you help them to pay, you lose all access to anything where it's just their name on the account. So how can this be rectified? Yes, it's the durable power of attorney. As I like to say, maybe it's the lamest superhero ever, the <laughs> power of attorney. Um, and you just imagine someone coming in with a cape and uh, power of attorney, but it actually is very powerful um, because when you turn 18, again, as, as Renee mentioned, parents, loved ones, everybody loses access to that adult child's um, business of life issues. So they can sign a durable power of attorney where they grant, they voluntarily can grant a parent, a, an older sibling, a loved one, someone they trust, the ability to take part in their day-to-day -day business of life issues. So that can cover helping out to make sure bills are paid, um, viewing financial records, accessing tax issues and dealing with those insurance issues. Can you even see your kids' insurance policies for their renter's insurance or other things, applications for financial aid or other educational issues? Um, and when your child, if, if your child is willing to set this up and they have to do this voluntarily, you can't impose this on your child. They are voluntarily granting you or someone else the ability to help them in these areas. And they can set it up so it's either springing, meaning it springs into power if they are incapacitated, or they can grant the power right away. So for example, if let's say you have a child who's going to study abroad, again, I'll say Southeast Asia, they're going to be away from computers a lot. They're not going to have much access. They might say, you know what, even if I am totally fine, if I'm not sick, if I don't have an accident, I want you, mom, to have the ability to sign documents for me, to view my records and, and to deal with any financial or business of life issues. So you can give a parent or a loved one the power to sign right away. You say, hey, I'm giving this, giving you this power right away. You don't need to show that I'm out of it or anything. The more traditional structure for adults is to say it's springing, meaning, hey, I'm naming you as my backup, but you can't really step in unless I am out of it. And you have a doctor's note saying I am incapacitated and need help. There's no right or wrong answer. It really depends on the situation. You have to be very careful when giving immediate power of attorney because there could be a lot of abuse there if you give it to the wrong person. We'll, we'll circle back to how important it is to set this up the right way with an attorney in a second, but it can be abused. There are many cases of celebrities giving power of attorney to the wrong person and they can, they can really take advantage. So you have to make sure it's the right person named. This is where you can a, an adult child can give you, the parent, the ability to view these records again and to help out. Um, anything else you'd add here on the financial side, Renee? 
Um, just that, yeah, you know, this also comes up when they are renting a place or there are landlord issues. And my daughter's friend was just in, in Spain for a semester and they needed to renew the lease. And so, you know, we are so much their personal assistance in so many ways that we don't even think about and, until this happens that um, it's, it's, it's critical to be able to make these. So even if they don't have a huge estate in here, they're not doing big deals. There are so many practical daily situations in which this is useful. Absolutely. Um, and now let's circle over to healthcare issues. So what about medical records? So Renee, you mentioned that when a child turns 18, you lose the ability to talk to their doctors unless they give you permission to use this. So why don't you talk us through the critical tool on the healthcare and medical decision-making side? Yeah, so uh, once a child turns 18, the healthcare records are private between the adult patient and the healthcare provider. Um, so, you know, if your child is incapacitated, they've been in an accident, something happens mid surgery, um, you cannot, or they're unconscious, you know, they need someone to be able to make that decision for them. You want to be able to step in and you don't want there to be a delay in time before you can respond and, and help the child and assess the situation. So yeah, anyone over 18 needs an, an advanced directive, not just someone going to college or someone with a large estate. This is a, a really key document. And I think sometimes we get caught up in tax planning or distributions or things like that. And we don't think about these really basic but incredibly important pieces like the healthcare directive and the, the financial um, document, durable power of attorney. So um, the other big piece of this is, is not being able to review the medical records. So not just making decisions if you're incapacitated, but also being able to review the medical record. Um, and I want to point out as a parent, you know, this is true, even if you're paying for their health insurance, you would think you'd get some access, but you don't, you just get to pay the money. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, and I do have a, a client who um, her daughter was in an accident. Um, she was unconscious and taken to a hospital. And um, my client was frantically calling around trying to figure out where she had been taken. And the facilities would not even tell her whether or not they had admitted her daughter, whether or not she was a patient there. So, you know, God forbid, hopefully none yeah. of these ever happen and they're not an issue, but it is very important to have it in place. Um, I'd also like to say that we have a fantastic durable power of attorney, but also a fantastic advanced healthcare directive. It's comprehensive. It, it considers a lot of situations and scenarios. It's not your run of the mill cookie cutter document. Um, it's it's when clients read it, I have had clients, you know, call and say they were so moved by what was in the document. So, yeah. And it, cause it, it's crucial, not just for the very basics of granting someone the ability to view records, but it also can communicate one's wishes for difficult situations. And that can be hard for an 18 year old to wrap their head around like, oh, well, what would I want if I'm in pain and in a long-term coma? I think most would say, yes, please give me pain medication. So when I was 18, uh, my parents had me sign an advanced directive because, you know, my parents are estate planning and other law attorneys. <laughs> I'm not, maybe not normal, but really everyone when they turn 18 should do this. So it was weird. But I remember one of the things that stood out was, hey, I get to say, if I'm in pain and can't really communicate, yes, give me pain medication, make me feel okay again. Um, but they can communicate that. But also if you're in a coma or a persistent vegetative state, you can say, look, if I don't have a chance of recovering, it's okay to let me go. You know, they don't have to address this, by the way. An 18-year-old does not have to address all these end-of-life issues. No. They can. And you need to make sure that your advanced directive is up to date as well. So your family knows what to do in different situations. But crucial, crucial uh, document that everybody needs. Otherwise, as Renee mentioned, you can't even get a hospital to tell you if your child is at the facility. They're over 18. They don't have permission to, to tell, tell you unless you can show that you have uh, an advanced directive and they've given permission. Let's now talk briefly about educational records. And what about, you know, what if your child is having major academic issues and you want to know what's going on and they're over 18? Well, Renee, why don't you talk us through the, the critical tool there and when it might come up? Yeah. So again, even if you're say, paying the tuition as the parent, uh, you don't have the right to the uh, educational records that's private between the student and the institution. Um, so 
uh, and this is just so that you will know it doesn't require an attorney, but there's an educational records release that most colleges offer. So they have a specific form that the students can sign, which is then going to allow the institution to release uh, educational information and records to you. Um, and so, you know, you may want a copy of your child's grade report um, and, and not necessarily for the traditional reasons of how are they doing or are they, you know, successful in their classes. But, you know, you might have an academic scholarship that you want to make sure is not in jeopardy um, or, you know, sometimes a dramatic drop in grades would flag that something is going on, trouble or a mental health issue or just, you know, trouble adjusting. Um, and also if there's financial aid, they always want you to add more forms and there are things that are incomplete. So you would be able to check and find out, you know, have the right documents been completed? Has everything been submitted? Um, so worth checking uh, with the school to make sure that you get that in place. Yeah, and a power of attorney will give you some ability to do this, but this is more specific for academic institutions. So yeah, and I think that's a really good point, Renee, that sometimes if you have the ability to see grades, you see a drop, that can be a sign of other issues when you may need to use that advanced directive to, to get more involved or that power of attorney to get more involved in, in other parts of your child's life if they're willing to give you that power. So um, one thing I'll just add here, and the third, doc so the two crucial documents, durable power of attorney for finances, advanced health care directive for medical decision making. Everyone over the age of 18 needs these. It, End of story, period, full stop. Um, once someone turns 18, though, and we have many webinars talking about why you need a living trust, if you have a house, if you have any assets, if you have kids of your own, a will is not enough. A will is not a good tool if you have significant assets. But if you just turned 18 or your child turned 18, maybe they have a little bit of money in the bank. You know, after college, maybe it's just debt, right? So maybe there's nothing there, but there's not much harm in a child preparing a simple will. We've helped many of our clients, adult children, before they're really getting started in the professional world to prepare simple wills, just say, hey, look, if something happens to me, I'd like to have some say in where my meager assets are going to go, you know, my baseball card collection, um, any gifts that I got during life and, and shares of stock, maybe it's just as long as under $150,000 total. A will may be okay, and, and it may not be stuck in the court system, what we call probate. So if you have any real assets, again, a will is not enough. It means your assets will be stuck in the California court system forever. But if it's a very small um, account or very small asset pool, a will may be enough. And it's a way for your child to say, look, I want, here's where I want my stuff to go. Maybe my sister, maybe not to my sister, uh, maybe to you guys, maybe to my friends. If they don't have a will in place, and God forbid something happens to, to them, the rules of intestacy. So state laws determine where assets go and you get a little bit complicated. So, you know, of course, if you do a will, that is a placeholder. Do not stick with that as, as anyone gains any assets. They need a revocable living trust. It needs to be set up properly. Um, so let's just explore what happens to an adult child if you don't have these documents. So let's go back to that story of Shauna and Myra that I told earlier where Shauna goes off to college, has some academic issues, some mental health issues. Myra, her mom, wants to help, but can't because the university medical system refuses to talk to her. The academic office refuses to talk to her. She can't get access to see Shauna's bank accounts and bills that are accruing and get going unpaid. Again, sorry, Shauna, that I'm picking on you. Shauna often edits these before they get posted to, to YouTube. So Shauna, I'm picking on you. But without documents in place, no one can step in to help Shauna. No, if, once someone is 18, no one can help without a court order. So if you don't have these documents in place, the power of attorney advance directive voluntarily granting a parent or someone else the ability to help. Well, what if parents need to get involved and their, and their child doesn't have these documents, loses capacity or refuses to cooperate? Well, you might have to go to court to get a conservatorship. It's very time consuming. It's very expensive. It's public. It's taking away um, an adult's ability to make decisions. You're getting a court order to say, the court is giving me the ability to take over a lot of decision-making. So one, you might not be able to get one if your child has capacity and just is refusing to cooperate. That's sort of a different issue. Two, it, it's just a very painful process. And we try to avoid these whenever we can. And that brings me just to this issue. And we help a lot of families with special needs planning. We have many webinars on special needs planning. Check out the Gilfix Law YouTube channel for many webinars on special needs planning. But we have a lot of clients who come in. They have a, a son or a daughter on the autism spectrum. 
for example, and it could be any disability or any issue where your child might have limited ability to, to take care of themselves or oversee their, their own issues. And a lot of people say, hey, I've been told I need to get a conservatorship. Can you help me with this? My kid's turning 18. And in some cases, if the child is very limited and really can't communicate or really can't understand what's going on around them, maybe we do need to get a conservatorship. And again, that means going to court to say, hey, when my turn, my kid turns 18, Renee went over what happens when a kid's 18, very different set of rights that a parent has to help out. If the kid cannot understand what's going on, you might need to get a court order saying mom and dad have the right to make decisions for the kid. But in many cases, if we can work with your adult child, even if they're on the autism spectrum, even if they have learning disabilities, even if they have some cognitive impairment, we can often help them to voluntarily give mom and dad the ability to help out via power of attorney for financial and educational issues, advanced directive for medical issues. Now they can always revoke this. Maybe they don't have capacity to do this, but I would say at least half the time, maybe two thirds of the time when families come to us and say, hey, I think I need to get a conservatorship. My kid is turning 18 or over 18. Um, we can often avoid that uh, by working with the adult child to voluntarily give mom and dad or a sibling the ability to help out. Um, and, and it's such a better way to do things if you can, because it's a yeah. way where your child can retain the ability to make decisions. They're not losing it to a court. Um, it's a, you know, again, it's a public process that is not very fun, right? So we've helped many families to avoid the costly public and challenging process of conser conservatorships. And again, it's a way for your child to maintain autonomy. Not always possible. We're, we're very open about that. But many times it is. And I'd say it's probably more possible than you might think. So talk to us if you have this issue. If you have a child turning 18, you're concerned about how can you continue to help them out uh, once they're 18. So let's now move over to how to put these documents into place. What do we need to do? Well, I'd say first, just beware, check, beware, check the box forms. You can download a lot of very simple forms. You can download simple advanced directives or power of attorney forms. But be careful with those because you might not even know what you're giving up or what your child's giving up in these documents. You really want to make sure that you're working with an attorney. If, if you're already working with our office, with Gilfix and the Poll, we have helped many adult children of clients to put these documents into place as long as they're okay with the fact we're also working with mom and dad. Um, but you need to make sure that you know what you're giving up. Um, there are many stories. I was just watching um, a documentary on Leonard Cohen, an extraordinary poet and musician. He wrote Hallelujah. Um, and I, when he was in his early or mid seventies, his business manager robbed him of everything. And I am almost certain I have to look into it more, but it was via power of attorney. He gave his, his business manager too much power to sign. He signed over everything and they took advantage of it. And what is he going to do once the money's all stolen and gone? So that's an extreme example. But when you're turning 18, you want to give up some powers, grant, grant other people the ability to help out in some ways, but maybe not everything. So it's really important that your adult child understands what they're giving, what powers they're sort of giving up or granting to other people and who they're naming. Um, they might want to name you and your spouse, your husband, your wife. Maybe they don't want to name mom and dad. Maybe it's someone else. But we have to make sure it's done properly and that they don't give up too many powers. And again, if you work with our firm, we give discounts um, when we're helping adult children on this. Renee's worked with some of the clients I've worked with. I've worked with some of Renee's clients on this. Um, but again, make sure it's done right and make sure there's more than just one backup. So maybe your adult son is like, okay, I'm going to name you mom and you dad, but it's really important for your, your son to also think about well, what if mom and dad aren't around, who can step in that. Maybe it's a sibling, maybe it's a family friend, maybe it's a relative. So really important to make sure these are, are properly in place. And Renee, as someone who's going through this with your adult children, any, any thoughts about getting these into place the right way? Um. Well, just back on that conservatorship point, I mm. do think that, um, you know, my goddaughter has autism and I'm seeing as she's aging that there's a lot of well-meaning people within the educational system and the special needs community who are really pushing her towards conservatorship um, when she certainly has uh, the capacity to do the, the powers of attorney, which is what she ended up doing. But um, yeah. I, you know, it, it, people are, are directing it that way and, and and they have a good intent but again like mark said it's it's so important to like, consider what is their capacity is there a lesser option for them where they could have a little more autonomy and you can keep it in your family without dealing with the court which may or may not be the case um 
And um, let's see. Well, um, in terms of the documents, I think this is also a good way to kind of pass on certain values to your children. Like the, you need to be taking care of your documents and having the right things in place and sort of dipping their toe into, you know, how do I deal with business? How do I take care of things for my family? And how do I deal with attorneys? And, you know, we're very used to dealing with all kinds of people, um, adults, young adults, uh, children with disabilities, um, making them comfortable and making sure that we're able to find out what their wishes are. Um, I think that's actually a, a great point, Renee. It's almost like your phone was dinging to say good points. I heard some sounds, <laughs> it was exactly perfect. No, but that was actually perfect. <laughs> because you're right, but this is an opportunity to bring your family together and to talk about these issues. And, and a lot of times clients will, the reason number one, when they have their kids come in is to get these documents into place, but reason number two is so they get to know us and they can ask questions about how this all works and start to familiarize themselves with mom and dad's issues and estate plan and the business of life and knowing, hey, there are advisors out there that can help you. And there's issues that you need to be aware of, but hey, there's resources out there. But it's also a wonderful way to talk about family values. I, I think that's mm -hmm. fantastic. So um, and I just want to point out along those lines about family discussions. It's not just your kids doing it here. When your kids turn 18, there are very real issues for you as parents, if you're, if you're a parent watching this. When your child is over 18, there are implications if you want to make sure, what if you're out of it? And if you, let's say you're helping to pay your kids medical bills or their educational expenses, or you have a child with a disability, um, you need to have a special needs trust in place to, to step in for you when you pass away if you have a child with a disability and you should have structures in place to support your children after you're gone. But again, long-term incapacity. What if you have dementia? What if you're in an accident? Once your child turns 18, we need to update your durable power of attorney document to make sure that if you want your money to be available to support your child, it does. And also to make sure that more sophisticated steps can be taken perhaps to protect assets for your kids, to protect assets for you if you need long-term care. Um, you might wanna add your adult child as a backup agent for you. We have some, some clients who think their 18 year olds aren't gonna be ready for this until they're 40, but we have others <laughs> who are like, you know what? My kid is already on top of this stuff. You know, She's already running an investment club. She's already started three businesses. She can handle this. Hey, name her as a backup for you if you feel good about that in your power of attorney, in your advanced directive, in your living trust. Um, or we can even add in, you know, when you feel like they're close, but not quite there, that maybe at 25 or 30, they can step up yep. as the agent under that. Great point. Yeah. As they become adults, you can see how close are they. You, you can, we have many clients who said, well, I have my, my brother will be our backup trustee or a backup agent in the power of attorney. My kid's not quite ready, but yes, when they turn 25, they become the backup or 30 or whatever age you want to say. So let's bring this all together. We've written, you can read uh, Michael Gilbert's wrote a book, Beat Estate Tax Forever, which actually covers a lot of basic estate planning issues as well. Um, so that's available to all of our clients. You can order on our website. It's available on Amazon as well. Um, but let's bring this all together. So if you have a child who's 17 now or 16, you're thinking about this, or maybe they just turned 18, maybe they're 20, and you just haven't addressed this yet, set a meeting with us. If you're an existing client or if you haven't yet, let's bring your planning issues together. We can also discuss your adult children's planning issues. They need a durable power of attorney advanced directive. If you're watching this and you're over 18 and you don't have these, you need a durable power of attorney and advanced directive, and you really should have a living trust as well. Um, but you need these documents and you want to set them up properly. You want to make sure they're done right, that you're not giving away powers you don't want to give away, but that you are empowering people you love and trust to do what they need to do to make sure you're protected, to make sure your assets are protected, and to make sure you're covered in a hospital. And for parents, uh, if you have adult children, you want to leave assets for them. Have you included dynasty trusts or as our firm calls them, family protection trusts? You want to protect your kids from divorce and lawsuits, at least the assets you leave them? This is a way to do it. You can provide incredible protections. See our webinar on this. We have a what is a dynasty trust webinar on the Gilfix Law YouTube channel. If you want to pass your home or if you have a rental property, you want to pass that to your kids. You need to be aware of some huge tax issues in California, Prop 19, where your kids could face a 20, 30, $40,000 a year increase in property taxes if you don't plan. So we want to bring this all together. If you're not sure about what issues you face, set a meeting with us. We'd love to get the chance to bring this all together because the power of attorney events directive are crucial, but there's one piece of the puzzle. So if you haven't met with us yet, 
set that meeting with Renee, with me, another member of our team, and we can help you bring this all together. And we can discuss how you can get these into place for your kids, or we can meet with your kids directly. Or if you're over 18, we can work with you. And we do provide significant discounts to the children of existing clients. And we want to make sure you're covered. You know, this is one piece of an estate plan. This is one piece of your overall multi-generational mission to preserve your assets and to pass along values. But this can be a wonderful way to bring your family together to talk about what really matters. And we are not just, you know, Mike and I, Michael Gilfix and I often lead these webinars, but it was so great to have you here today, Renee. Thank you for, for joining us. And, you know, it's not just, it, it's Mike, it's me, it's Renee, it's Francis LePoul, it's Nick Klingenberg. We have a great team, uh, multi-generational team. So of course, if you want to meet with us, very easy to find us. You can find us at gilfix.com. You can call our office at 650-493-8070 to set a meeting. If you're an existing client, let's take a fresh look at where you're at. And if we need to make any updates, maybe it's time to bring your kids in for a discussion um, and help them set up their, their key documents, that power of attorney advance directive. Or you get to questions in just a second, we got some good ones. But very easy to find us. And if you haven't subscribed, subscribe to our Gelfix Law YouTube channel. Like this video, comment, share it if it's useful. But please make comments if you thought it was useful. And if anybody in your circle could benefit from this, you are ahead of the game now. Spread the word. Let them know. You know, they, they, not everybody has to work with attorneys on this, but it is crucial that everybody has this. So I think we're now going to get to just a couple questions. Um, so I have one good question from... Deborah, so Deborah, thank you for for your question. So, if my adult ch child's assets are over two hundred thousand dollars, but are in brokerage accounts that list beneficiaries, does that override California's rules of intestacy? So, first, if your adult child, for, they need to have that durable power of attorney for finances and the advance directive. But let's say all of their assets, and they probably have others, but let's say the bulk of their assets are two hundred thousand. It's over the limit for probate. It's about one hundred fifty, hundred sixty thousand. But if the accounts have beneficiary designations on them, does that override California rules for intestacy or probate? And the answer is yes. If you have a beneficiary's name for an account that does override um, probate, it overrides the rules of intestacy. But we, if, if you have over $200,000, that's when you should really start thinking about having a living trust. Because if what if something changes? You know, Beneficiary designations are okay, but they don't cover anything going wrong. You know, so if you name someone and that person is incapacitated or that person predeceases you, it's often missing provisions for that. Or what if your child has a child of their own in the future? They forget to update those beneficiary designations. Well, that's big trouble. Who can step in to manage those accounts if your child becomes incapacitated? Having it in a living trust is, is really a great way to, to ensure that's all covered. Um, so good question. Um, but yes, they would be temporarily okay, but they really should get a living trust into place if they have over $150,000. Um, another question is, does my child have to name me as a parent in these documents? And the answer is no, they can name whoever they want. So when, a, when an adult child meets with us, we have to make it clear that both parent and child agrees, they both agree that we can represent both of them. And if there's ever a conflict between a child and a parent, we can't take sides. We have to withdraw as an attorney. But it's not necessarily a conflict if a child says, you know what, I don't want to name my parents. Even if mom and dad are chipping in for legal bills, they can name whoever they want. Um, and we don't necessarily have the right to even tell mom and dad if the child names somebody else. There's also attorney-client privilege there. So all this to say they can name whoever they want. In most cases, kids are okay, especially when they're 18, 19 naming mom and dad. Any other thoughts there, Renee, about who people- I mean, it's, it is really common to name mom and dad. Sometimes we see the vying for position with the parents <laughs> or, you know, a, a relative, a backup, um, you know, anyone over 18, though, technically can be named. Obviously, you know, when a child meets an attorney, we're, we're trying to give them good guidance about, you know, what they're looking for in that person. Yeah, excellent points. And, and um, Another good question, I've, I've, this actually came up in a client meeting yesterday where a longtime client mentioned earlier, her son just had a stroke uh, at a pretty young age, and now she's frantically trying to help. Um, and the question is, just because a child, adult child signs these documents, how do institutions and hospitals know that I have the power? Is there some central place where these documents are stored? And the answer is, there's no central place. It's really up to you and your adult child to make sure you have copies so you can present them to banks 
to academic offices, to hospitals. So you really need to have backup copies of all these. You know, maybe you just keep a PDF of a scan of a signed document, and that's often enough. Um, Having these does not ensure it will be smooth sailing. Some institutions are just painful to work with, even if there's a valid power of attorney, but usually eventually they will, once they have the documents, once you talk to the right people, you can almost always get access eventually. Um, and, and another point I would add is your child should sign a comprehensive, sophisticated power of attorney, but if they have a lot of assets at a specific bank or they're doing all their business of life stuff at one institution, you might want to go there and have them sign a bank specific form. So, you know, if you go to, you know, Wells Fargo or Bank of America, they often have their own only specific to Bank of America accounts or, or bank, uh, Wells Fargo accounts, specific forms where you can give someone else power of attorney to step in for you. So that can't hurt. You want it to be consistent with your other documents. Um, but it, all this really just crucial, just get something into place. Um, mm -hmm. And I've other, had uh, clients um, provide their healthcare directives to, um, you know, the Kaiser or well, not to name yeah. any particular whatever institution, um, and then come back later and have them say we don't have it on file. So you know, if you ever are having surgery, anything happening, you want to take a copy of that with you just in case. Yes, no harm, no harm in having extra copies with you. Just hand it out like candy to the the hospital staff. You know, there's it's. <laughs> It, it can't hurt. And hospitals lose track of things all the time. Um, so I think we'll wrap it up on that note. But, you know, thank you guys so much for joining us here today. I hope you got a lot out of this. Again, if you like this, it'll be on our YouTube channel, like it on YouTube or comment or share it. But regardless, contact us, gilfix.com, if we can be of service to you and your family. If you're not if you're confused about something, let us know. We can set a planning meeting. Renee, me, Mike, Nick, Francis, one of us can sit down and, and make sure you're really well covered. So um, as my mom likes to say, I hope you're all staying safe, sane, and healthy. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. We're going to have weekly webinars on our channel. So take, take a look, follow our website. We're going to have more talks coming up. So thank you so much. And thank take you. Care. Have a good day.